Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, the Gospel of Mark is the second Gospel in the New Testament. It is sandwiched between the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. And those are called the synoptic Gospels because they are seen optically as being similar. But the Gospels are also very different in their own ways. The Gospel of Mark does not mention anything about the genealogies of Jesus. It doesn't tell us his background or anything about his ancestry. The Gospel of Mark does not mention anything about the Christmas story. There is no mention about the encounter with the angels, no annunciation, no conflict or drama between Joseph and Mary about whether or not to get married even though she has a child and they have not been together. There is no mention of Elizabeth or Zachariah, no mention about the journey to Bethlehem and the trial of finding no room in the inn. There is no mention about the birth of Jesus in a stable and lying in the manger. The Gospel of Mark does not tell us anything about the shepherds out in the fields nearby or the visit of the Magi two years later. It does not mention anything about Joseph, about Simeon or Anna the prophet when Jesus was brought to the temple on the eighth day. It tells us nothing about Jesus teaching at the temple in Jerusalem when he was 12 years old. We hear nothing about the flight to Egypt or any of those things that are so well known to us in the Gospels of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. So Mark's Gospel is a little different. It starts right, right away in the very first verse, and it says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Bang, right there, it tells us what this Gospel is about. But this Gospel is very important. And so who is the person who wrote this Gospel? We often know this writer, Mark, by the name John Mark. He was a cousin of Barnabas. We know Mark's mother's name was Mary, but a different Mary. And we find that John Mark was taken along on the first missionary journey by Paul and Barnabas. And they traveled and they were preaching the Word of God and they were having all kinds of challenges. It was not easy to be a first century missionary, preaching a message that people did not want to hear, that people would reject, that people would challenge you about. Not much different than today, actually. But as a journey, Mark had some challenges. We don't know exactly why, but about halfway through the journey, Mark returns home. He discontinues, he stops going. We don't know the exact reason why. We don't know if he was sick, if he couldn't face up to the challenges. We don't know why he was not able to continue on. Some speculate and think he was a quitter at he was one who would not want to continue on. What we do know is that when he left the journey, they were in Cyprus and they faced many demonic challenges in that place. Maybe he was discouraged because we know that there was only one conversion in Cyprus. In all the work that they did, only one person came to faith. And so it was a challenge for them and for Mark, and he left. 
a little later, when Paul decided he wanted to go back to visit some of those cities that they had been to on their first journey, they wanted to go on a second journey. And Barnabas, the son of encouragement, he wanted to bring Mark along. But Paul was not willing. He was saying, we need someone more dependable, someone we know will not quit halfway through, whatever the challenge is. And so Paul and Barnabas had this sharp disagreement. And they went their separate ways. Paul took Silas and went in one direction. And Barnabas took Mark. And they went back to Cyprus, that very place where he had turned back. It's amazing to see that they went right back to the very same place that maybe he faced his greatest challenge. He didn't back away, but he went right back to that place. And we learn later on that that work became more fruitful. And that's where we learn about the person of Mark. And so this gospel written by Mark was written around the year 55 to 60 AD. It's not the first earliest of the gospels, but it was powerful nonetheless. The reason it does not mention anything about Jesus' genealogy or the Christmas story is because Mark's travel led him to write mostly to Gentile people, to the Greeks and to the Romans. That's who he was writing to. And thus, they would not have much context or understanding about the Jewish historical aspects. And so he skips it, but he gets right to the point. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That was what he was proclaiming. That's what he wanted his readers to know. And so that gospel is important for us to understand. Last year, starting at the Pentecost season through the rest of the church year, we focused on the gospel of Matthew. And we learned the five major teaching sections of Matthew. This year is the gospel of Mark. And even though we had splatterings of the readings of Mark and the gospel of John since the beginning of the church year, starting from the Pentecost season through the end of the church year, we will focus chapter by chapter, verse by verse, all the way through the gospel of Mark. And so we want to grasp and understand this gospel. And so we look at our reading today. It comes from Mark chapter 4. And Mark chapter 4 is the kingdom of God chapter. It has four parables about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a wonderful thing. And yet it is hard to grasp. What exactly is it? How do we understand it? Because the way things work here on earth is not always the same as how God will do things according to the kingdom of God. And so what might seem like something very simple might be very complex or the other way around. What might seem unbelievable is very believable. That's the kind of things we learn about the kingdom of God. And so Matthew, Mark's gospel here in chapter 4 begins with the parable of the sower. You remember that parable about sowing seeds on the path, in rocky places, among thorns, and on good soil. And then we have the parable of the lamp. A lamp that has a light put on it. And that light should not be covered. And it's connected to the passage in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus says he is the light of the world and it should not be hidden. And that's where the song, this little gospel light of mine is based on, on these two passages. So I'm going to have Otis play that song for us. And I want you to sing it. And I want you to do the hand motions to it. Hi, I'm Matilda. 
turning and watching so I hope you were doing the thing finger waving and whatever else so uh, that was a song so I learned this song and it was always confusing to me what the lyrics were especially that second part where it says hide it under a bushel no is it hide it under a bushel no or someone said no 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 that's wrong it's hide it under a bush oh no so it's like which version is correct which lyrics so i I've, I've been singing it wrong or i've got it wrong and it's confusing to me but that's the second parable in chapter four and then comes our lesson from mark chapter four verses 26 through 34 and it talks about the kingdom of god these are kingdom parables the first parable is about some amazing growth that happens. Plant the seeds, you don't have to do anything. It just grows. We don't know why, but God grows. It's just a reminder. That's how the kingdom of God works. It does not depend on our efforts, our good works, what we do or don't do. Because ultimately, in God's kingdom, He grows that which He desires. He blesses in His time all that he desires for the kingdom of God. And then when it comes to the second of the, second of the four parables or the fourth parable, the parable of the mustard seed, it says you take the mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds, and it grows into the biggest and largest plant. Well, we have to remember that this is a parable. That's why Jesus had to explain it afterward to the disciples. He was speaking in hyperbole. The mustard seed is not actually the smallest seed in the world. But in God's kingdom, he's making a picture. Because the plant that grows is not the largest plant either. But it is the largest plant in an herbal garden. And so when Jesus tells this parable, that mustard seed and this giant plant, he's painting a picture, using hyperbole to explain that's how the kingdom of God works. That the smallest things can have the greatest impact too. We are able to see and understand that lesson about small and large. We are a small church and that's okay. That's a good thing if we recognize the strengths of a small church. There's some challenges for a small church as well. But we also recognize the blessings of a small church. And not allow that to be an excuse for not doing certain things. And so we've talked about those kinds of things before. But what I want us to focus on is on the purpose that we exist. And so I've had those up here, and I've been praying about these three reasons why we exist. And 
I've been sharing this with our leaders and they've given feedback to it. Why do we exist? The first is that we exist to proclaim the gospel to the multi-ethnic people in our communities. People from every nation, multi-ethnic, ethne, nations. And in our communities, doesn't mean just around our church. It means whatever community you find yourself, your community when you are at home, your community among your co-workers, your community among your friends, your community where you hang out, wherever you are, that is your community. And that's where we can all be witnesses of God's gospel. Next reason, we exist to enable other language and cultural ministries to launch and to thrive. That's what we do. The blessing of our Ethiopian congregation on our Bethel campus. Worship and ministry in the Hamaric language. The blessing of Glory for Jesus Church, our Spanish-Hispanic congregation in the afternoon, reaching the Spanish-speaking people, doing things that we otherwise are not able. Our participation in reaching the Chinese speaking through our food pantry ministry, where you are participating and engaging and blessing those people in our, current, in our community. That's why we exist and that's what we are able to, to do, reaching hundreds of people through our small church. That's like that mustard seed, that small mustard seed that has a big plant at the end. And the last reason we exist, well, I mean, not the last reason, but a third reason we exist, to bless our communities through word and sacrament ministry, Christian fellowship and Christian service. And so we continue to gather to celebrate God's goodness and blessing through our time together in worship, that you may be encouraged, that we may together be encouraged and strengthened in our faith, that together we may walk with God in unity knowing God's blessing for us, that we may grow in our love for God together and in our love for one another. And in that time of Christian fellowship, being able to gather together in person to engage and to have unhurried conversation and even to be able to carry out service to others. It's Christian service because we are Christian. And those opportunities continue. Just this week, the Northeast Medical Services, who have an office on San Bruno Avenue and throughout the Bay Area, contacted us and said, would you like to host a event here to serve the community? And we are going to have more conversations about that. We want to be of service to our community. That's why we exist. And so those are wonderful lessons that we can learn from this parable about the mustard seed. There are things we recognize that God is working and doing among us. Things that we can never even imagine. The smallest of things can grow to be the largest of things in the kingdom of God. And that's why we want to learn more about the gospel of Mark. In the name of Jesus, by his power and for his glory. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding. God save your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.